Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are in a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Arn with the founder of the Four Horsemen, the Hall of Famer himself, the Enforcer, Double A, Arn Anderson. Arn, how are you, man? It's springtime, isn't it? Yeah, it's WrestleMania season. Well, I mean, I guess you don't say that anymore, but wrestling fans still do. I'm excited that we're covering a WrestleMania today. This is a good time of year to be a wrestling fan. Yes, it is. And uh, everything's picking up. You know, it's uh, all the things that surround WrestleMania and uh, that week and people coming in from all around the world to see whatever shows are out there. They pretty much go to everything and every signing. And uh, it's uh, it's just a really good week of the year. You're not going to miss it this year, though, are you? I mean... You used this probably if you were on the staff, this was a, a hellacious week, WrestleMania week, right? God awful for the, for the producers. It was hell week it really was cause you just had to, you know, you, you, you would go to meetings and you would be trying to organize stuff and set stuff up and you didn't have any answers and couldn't get any answers about what was available to you and who was doing what and what order you were on on the show and just everything that mattered for WrestleMania as far as structuring that show, you couldn't get any info on. So it was a little bit frustrating. And as the week got towards the end, it just got harder and harder and harder. Well, let's talk about one that went down 10 years ago, it's WrestleMania 26, March 28th, University of Phoenix Stadium, Glendale, Arizona. There's 72,219 fans there. We've got a $5.8 million gate, making it the highest grossing and attended entertainment event held at the University of Phoenix Stadium. And at the time, this WrestleMania was the third live gate, third biggest live gate ever of all the WrestleManias. Uh, it's going to do monster business on pay-per-view as well. 885,000 buys grossing $49 million in revenue, just high marks across the board. So it makes sense that there's all this extra added pressure for everybody. That's the first time WrestleMania is held in Arizona. The third time that WrestleMania is held in an open air, uh, venue. Talk to me a little bit about, I guess I should mention it happened at WrestleMania nine. And then again, at WrestleMania 24, talk to me about how it's different performing in a building where there is no top from a performer standpoint, because you guys used to do this a lot way back on the great American bash tour. Gosh, more than 30 years ago. Now I've heard that the sound isn't the same. The sound just goes up. It doesn't come back down. Is there another challenge or is that true? Uh, what performers deal with in the ring when there's no top on the building? 
Well, it's if you're in a place where the temperature is good, you know, if you're 60-ish at bell time, that's really comfortable. It's uh, It just, you know, it gives you more oxygen. It gives you a better environment. That cool, crisp air is invigorating. From a performance standpoint, uh, that all works great. But there is a real issue with when there's no roof on the building, all the sound goes straight up and disappears, and you don't get that feedback from the fan reaction immediately like you do when it's bouncing off the walls and coming back to you. The acoustics are not there. The immediate reaction, it just it just feels funny. It's almost like a delayed reaction. Something will happen. There will be a reaction, but you don't get the immediate boom right back to you. So it is a little funky, uh, but when you got that many people, they can drown out most anything, and uh, it, it, it's an experience that every wrestler should experience at least once in their life. Do you like retro video games, movies, or wrestling from the 80s and 90s? If so, you've got to subscribe to the Dirty Game Room on YouTube. Every week, there's a new episode up covering what we all grew up with, the golden age of the WWF, WCW, and ECW. The Dirty Game Room covers not only wrestling, but also classic Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, and Nintendo 64 games like Contra, Donkey Kong, WWF WrestleFest, No Mercy, Sonic, and so much more. It also goes over all the terrible games too, like Friday the 13th and Karate Kid, all for a good laugh, of course. So if you're looking for something to watch the next time you're holding your phone while taking a massive shit on the toilet, you might as well do yourself a favor and give the Dirty Game Room on YouTube a watch. If you like movies like Terminator 2, The Crow, Nightmare on Elm Street, Hook, and other classics from that era, this is definitely the channel for you. And right now, the Dirty Game Room is giving away a custom Cobra Kai Nintendo for free to one lucky subscriber. So pull out your phone, click on the YouTube app, and type in the Dirty Game Room and smash that subscribe button. The Dirty Game Room, where it's all retro all the time. What a set this one was. The the ring is on the 50-yard line. A lot of the equipment was shipped from the 2010 Winter Olympics in uh, Vancouver, Canada. Over a thousand lights are used. And they're going to, um, adapt to decrease in sunlight as the show continues into the night. The, uh, entrance stage is eight feet off the stadium floor. It's 120 feet wide. And in an interview with uh, the Arizona Republic, the production manager, Brian Petrie says, this is a completely new design that's never been done anywhere and won't be done again. Really unbelievable what all they're putting together with this. I mean, the entrance ramp is linked to a stage that's lined with cauldrons of fire, each at a temperature of a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. There's 400,000 individual pieces of pyrotechnic product that are going to launch 200 feet into the open air. They've never done it this big before. And this type of planning starts a year out. Um, I mean, from their production, they get into the nitty gritty details starting six months out. It's estimated that it took a hundred trucks just to deliver the equipment by comparison, a regular pay-per-view. There's probably a dozen trucks. Talk to me about just the, the size and scale and scope of the production piece of this show that we fans maybe aren't really familiar with. I think, I think you just did it. It's, um, it is more expensive and more involved and involves more people, more planning than anything you could ever imagine. It's so over my head. I've just, I'm like everybody else. I get there a few days in advance. I go out to the stadium a time or two and I just get to see the process of it starting out as nothing and developing into something and something pretty incredible and hats off to all the people that are responsible for building it, making sure it's safe, testing it. Uh, it's, it is a uh, week long deal with God knows how many employees that they may be using out there to get all this stuff done. But thank God for the team that they have because it's damn near impossible. 
of course, WrestleMania has always been a beast from a promotional aspect. Even your first WrestleMania, mm-hmm. WrestleMania five in 1989 promotion through the roof, bigger than any show you'd probably ever been on at that point. And when you return to the WWE, your next WrestleMania is, uh, 18 in 2002. We know you're going to slip in there and give undertaker the spawn buster. By that point, the production aspect of WrestleMania is totally different. And of course, eight years later here in 2010, we're upping the ante, but the production difference between 89 when you're wrestling and then in 18, when you slip in there to help nature out, it's a, a whole new world in those 13 years. Is it not? Yes, it sure is. It sure is. We were in, uh, Trump castle, I guess it would be called would be the arena. Is that correct? Trump Plaza. Yeah. Yep. Trump Plaza. And, uh, you know, it was big and it was full and it was loud. Um, but it was nothing like being in a stadium with 90,000 people. It, uh, you know, Madison Square Garden, everybody always says, you know, is their favorite arena and all those things. Well, that's just sentiment. It's not, it can't compare to, to going across to the to Giant Stadium, Jet Stadium, you know, out any outdoor venue. This, you know, this one coming up, Tampa Bay, it just... So many people out there and the scale of the audience is just, you know, just watching them do a wave, you know, is is flimsy as that may sound is something to behold when it's a hundred thousand people and they're all on board and they're all having a good time. It's uh, it has continued to evolve. Uh, Who knows? Sky's the limit. They always come up with something creative for entrances, but I think it's kind of like Foley going off the top of the hill in the cell. They've about reached the uh, ceiling about what they can do as far as production. Let's talk a little bit about how this day goes from your perspective. You know, we know that the production Mm -hmm. setup starts Lord way ahead of time. Uh, As you said, maybe a week out. When do you first make your way? over to see the set do you go over the day before and start going through matches or do you show up day of for the first time what does that look like from a producer standpoint no just out of curiosity uh we get there we don't have much to do the first day it's a travel day from it was when it was smackdown you know monday tuesday television then we would head over on wednesday uh, we would ride on out to the stadium usually every year and just to walk around and get a look at the first stages of what was going on production wise and what the setup was going to be um, locker room wise in conjunction to where was the producer's room going to be because that all matters on uh, show day. If your room is not set up close to talent and one of those little carts doesn't happen to be zipping by that you can catch a ride on you can walk yourself to death that day trying to keep up with talent and referees and uh announcers and everybody that you want to include in on your story it's uh it can be a tough road you know covering that stadium that day so you want to get the lay of the land and then later in the week you know uh you might have uh entrance rehearsals two days or one day before mania i think it's usually one day before you have you go out and you time out your entrances and all that stuff and figure that into your match time and then it's show day and uh you've had enough meetings by then probably two three four with the talent with the with the boss and then our standard production meeting and all that So uh, you're ready to rock and roll by the time it gets to show day. And uh, here we go. Let's talk about some news and notes as we lead into WrestleMania. Meltzer would write, the company made five cuts this past week. Paul Burchill, Gregory Helms, Maria, Charlie Haas, and referee Scott Armstrong. Burchill was cut. He's 30 years old and he's cut simply because they can't come up with anything for him to do. And Meltzer would say he was a talented guy who had improved in the ring and was strong on the mic. Uh, meanwhile, hurricane, he's 35. He came to the company in 01 as part of the WCW buyout, 
but he was let go partially because of an arrest in late January where, uh, after a uh, SmackDown taping the night before in Cincinnati, he and Chris Jericho, uh, maybe had a little too much to drink. They were arrested for public intoxication, a misdemeanor and paid $159 in fines and court costs. Allegedly they were play fighting in the backseat of a taxi. It got real. And, uh, he was on thin ice as a result and most expected he would be let go. Uh, Maria, they let go. She's 28 and they cut her the day after her birthday. And she said that she wanted to start doing other things anyway, partially because she wanted to be a mom and wanted to get married. And you can't really do that when you're on the road. So she had to find a job that will allow her to do that. Uh, and then Charlie Haas, he was cut. He asked for his release a few months prior. They didn't give it to him. Eventually they came back and told him they were giving, going to give him a raise and probably wouldn't use him. And, uh, eventually they thought, Hey, this is just hard to justify and cut him loose. But Armstrong, he's 50 and Meltzer would say this was a, his release was a big surprise to everyone. He was considered one of the company's one of the company's best referees and was friends with a lot of the talent because he'd been a solid experienced wrestler for a long time. When, when the news comes out that there's going to be cuts, what, uh, when do you producers find out and, and how nervous does that make everybody in the entire organization? Well, it used to be a yearly thing. Um, it, I don't know if it happened after mania because we would go through a little bit of a lull. There was a time of year that it occurred and I don't know why I remember this, but one year in particular, there were 17. Mm-hmm total let go. Uh, and, and I don't remember the time of year, but it would just, you know, kind of come out of nowhere. And, uh, some of the cuts you could tell, you know, you'd tell yourself, well, it doesn't make, you know, I hate it for the person. Nobody wants to see anybody lose their job, especially in this industry, especially at that time, because there was only one big company flourishing and there was nowhere to go. So it was pretty much you had to go get a job, and uh, nobody wants that for a wrestler. They want them to be able to, you know, to make a living in their in their chosen field. Um, besides Charlie, you know, Charlie Haas was a was a very good talent and a very good guy, and I thought a lot of the Charlie still do. Like you said, Armstrong was a guy that was experienced for the locker room and. He was a good guy to have on that crew of refs because uh, he could look at it from a, a performer uh, standpoint as well when making decisions and helping the refs and and all that stuff. Um, you never you never want to hear anybody has lost their job in this business, and uh, you know that never get is fun. That's for sure. Around the same time, Tommy Dreamer left the company and he, he took to his blog to write that him quitting WWE was the hardest decision he'd ever had to make in his career because he'd been there almost 10 years and he liked all the people associated with the company and he was going to miss them and the fans. But he says, I left for many reasons, which I will not discuss here. ECW was my world and all that I have is because of ECW. My connection to the fans is something that means so much to me. And when I was the main event of ECW, it was the highest rated main event every year. You can look it up. Me and Chavo 1.6, me and Mark Henry 1.5, me and Kozlov 1.3. And that match was poo poo. Hell me and big daddy V did a 1.2. Many men and women come on that show. And it was good old reliable me. That was the highest rated every year. That's a hard pill to swallow. When you hear of the falling ratings of ECW networks, wanting to change the show because of ratings. And if you want to read into my leaving of ECW, you can relate it to the Conan O'Brien saga with his show. And of course the idea there is Conan was Conan O'Brien was supposed to take over for Jay Leno. Jay Leno decided he didn't really want to leave. So he went on after ultimately he winds up leaving and, uh, going to TBS. Tommy is, uh, a guy that fans have loved for a long, long time. What do you think of his decision to leave here? And what can you tell us about Tommy dreamer that we may not know? Tommy is a wrestler that loves to wrestle. Now I'm sure he was, you know, forced into the business end of ECW, 
but he probably took on that role uh, wholeheartedly because he wanted to see it survive and flourish. But Tommy is just an old school guy that probably, if the truth's known, I've never talked to him about it, but I've talked to him about a thousand other things, you know, and he's a passionate guy and he's a pleasant guy to do business with. He works his ass off. He does a lot of good things, you know, in the ring as far as storytelling. And uh, basically, he's one of those guys like myself. He loves to wrestle. And he probably, if I remember correctly, wasn't getting to wrestle enough. He wasn't getting used enough. Uh, he certainly wasn't given credit for anything, which is, you hear that story cut popping up just about every conversation about that company, you know, people that are overlooked, people are, are uh, just stuck in the back closet and take them out, you know, whenever you want to dust them off and use them and, and then wonder why they're not over. But Tommy was a passionate guy and I'm sure he was just wanting to wrestle and wrestle, you know, regularly and be figured in. If you're not figured in in a storyline on the show, no one feels it worse than you. You know, you just feel like you're an outsider looking in, in your own company. And um, I would suspect that's pretty close to what happened to Tommy. Let's talk about something that happened to the Ultimate Warrior. It comes out that the Ultimate Warrior has pulled out of the Hall of Fame uh, based on the size of the payday and the terms of the non compete clause. Meltzer would write, generally speaking, WWE Hall of Famers get $5,000 plus a ring, although numbers may be different for the main event names. And one would think Warrior, since the ceremony was to be built around him, would have gotten more. And we know, of course, Warrior actually went in in 2014. Did you hear of Warrior sort of playing hokey pokey with the idea of going in and then ultimately balking at the terms of the deal? Not really. If I, if I heard it, it was, you know, by that time, no problem believing it. You know, it was still one of those things to me. And even today, when I hear about it, when someone's offered the hall of fame and they go, well, hmm, let me think about that. I'll get back to you. You know, immediately there, you know, two things pop in my mind. How is someone able to negotiate that without the guy on the other end going, okay, well, we thought we had a Hall of Famer. Thanks. Anyway, boom, click. You know, how they're able to negotiate that and, and actually have the company having to call them and call them back and, and prod them to be in. And uh, the other side of that is, you know, the Hall of Fame has been um, something that every wrestler wanted to be in, I would think, in the back of his mind, but you don't base your career around it. You don't base who you are around it. You don't, at the end of the day, when it's all said and done and you're not a Hall of Famer, you don't look at yourself as being less than. It's not like the Baseball or Football Hall of Fame where it's a direct stats to performance, to you're in or you're out, and uh, it's it's black and white. You know, there are a lot of people that should be in the Hall of Fame, uh, WWE Hall of Fame, that aren't, and there are some that are in that shouldn't be. And that's all, you know, matter of opinion and is subjective, and it's not me to make that call, or it's not up to anybody else individual to make that call. It's... Uh, it should be what the fans want. You know, they know who a Hall of Famer is. They know they've been watching 20, 25 years. You know, we should put that in their hands, who's in the Hall of Fame. I bet you would get a clearer, more concise choice, and it would make more sense a lot of times. Um, but then again, that's me, and I feel like this is a fan-driven business, and if you're not giving them what they want so that they can give you back what you need to prosper as a company— you're making a mistake. What do you think about the hall of fame? You know, some guys say, oh, it's uh, audience of one it's politics. It doesn't really matter that much. It's just entertainment. It's a TV show. It's a payday. Uh, others say no hall of fames are legitimate. Just 
not WWE's, you know, the wrestling observer hall of fame or, you know, the one in Waterloo or but there's a handful of other pro wrestling hall of fame. I think there's one in New York. Those are the more legitimate ones. This one's just a, a, a TV show. And then there are others who think, no, this is the highest profile hall of fame in the world. This is the one I want to be a part of. Where do you fall on that WWE hall of fame? I won't judge anybody else's induction or any other date or city or time. I can tell you what it meant to me to be on that stage with the guys I was inducted with and to have Dusty Rhodes be the one to put us in. It was the pinnacle of my wrestling life from age eight to me sitting here right now talking into this microphone. It was the most special day that I've ever spent inside this business with anyone under any circumstances, uh, just because of the history that had went on before it. Um, to this day, the feud that we had, the Horseman and, and Dusty Rhodes, has lived to, to make a statement here that's pretty profound in infamy. I think one of our great presidents said that around World War II time, right before the shit hit the fan. Uh, but it was a moment in time 85, 86, 87, 88, that I call the glory years, the golden years of wrestling. Guys that got over during that period, you could check off any name you want. If they're still around or still alive, and even if they are deceased, guys that got over during that period are still over today. So you tell me if there wasn't something special about that era then why? Why are those people still over? And uh, standing on that stage and getting the reaction I got from that audience, it just sends chills through me right now. Um, hairs are standing up on my arm, reliving it. It's It was a very special night for me. And did I think in my mind, did it mean to me that I was being honored as one of the greatest wrestlers that ever lived? No. I never thought that. I just think when those people gave me that stand and O, which I'm much appreciative of, and I've said many times it was the grandest night of my life, I think it was their acknowledgement of a body of work where they they knew when they bought a ticket to see you, man, you were going to go out and give them everything you had. And I think that was what it was based on more than anything. And their expectations were high when they would go to an arena, and when they left that night, those expectations had been met. And I think that was their acknowledgement of that. And I was grateful for it and something that you carry around with you the rest of your life. That's my interpretation of what the hall of fame is and was, and means to me. The 2010 class was Stu Hart, Ted DiBiase, Wendy Richter, Maurice, mad dog, Vashon, gorgeous, George and Antonio Inoki. Bob Euchre goes into the celebrity ring. Or celebrity wing, easy for me to say. Uh, your old pal Ted DiBiase has been making the news lately. Have you talked to Ted in a while? No, I haven't. It's going to be a hard phone call to make, to be honest with you. Oh. Certainly nothing I want to discuss here. Oh, no, of course not. I just, uh, you know, you know, there's, there's two sides to every story and, and I hope everything winds up the way it's supposed to. Yeah. Cause that's, uh, you know, I hope to God there's a lot more to the story and somebody's got their wires crossed and there's been something said that might have got overblown or misinterpreted. I'm just hoping for the best and kind of planning for the worst. Well, I think we're all hoping for the best. I mean, everybody listening to this podcast grew up a huge fan of the million dollar man and uh we don't want to see uh any of our friends go through uh challenges. So Let's keep it positive as much as we can. And let's talk about a positive change that's coming down. Meltzer would say the company now officially has banned chair shots to the head, which TNA seems to have also put a stop to stop to the company will either legitimately fine or suspend someone who violates the policy uh, or delivers any kind of real blow to the head that is believed to be intentional. Uh, this is probably long overdue. I mean, 
uh, of course, for years and years, we didn't know what we know now about CT, uh, CTE and, and just head trauma. And now that we're a little smarter, I think, uh, some of these changes were necessary. I'm for it. How about you? Damn right. Uh, you know, the talent puts herself at risk, just going out and having a regular wrestling match. And the, uh, the fact is that is not a trampoline we're performing in those ropes hurt when you hit them, that ring hurts when you take a bump in it, there's no getting around it. If you don't believe it, form a line, come on in the ring and let me slam everybody. That's a doubter. It will wake you up to what the reality of our business is. Um, and to take a steel chair, which is a steel chair, and hit somebody in the head with it, it's uh, there's no soft area. There's no place you can uh, do it properly. It's just it is what it is. It's a metal chair to the head. And <laughs> when God was coming up with a plan to form the human body, he didn't say, okay, I'm going to make this head chair resistant. He just said, okay, it's bone like everything else and it can be chipped and it can be broke and it can be cracked. And so that's what a head is. It's nothing uh, other than just a part of your body that is susceptible to injury at any time. And certainly a chair shot is uh, very, very dangerous. And uh, thank God we have put the brakes on chair shots to the head anyway. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad they're gone. And, um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's necessary changes and, and, and I'm glad that we're getting better in time. And thankfully, uh, it's time to talk about WrestleMania 26. There was a battle Royale with everyone who was not on the show. Otherwise, uh, with the exception of Ezekiel Jackson, whose father passed away over the weekend, uh, Meltzer would say he thinks pretty much everyone not on the main card was in this, including guys like Zack Ryder and fit Finley, um, Hornswoggle got involved at one point too. And, uh, Yoshi Tatsu ended up tossing out, uh, Zack Ryder for the win and calls it. It was fine for what it was two stars in more recent years. Uh, people have become a little more critical of the idea of having a, uh, sort of catch all match like this, uh, at WrestleMania, a battle Royal or something like this. Do you like the idea of let's get everybody we can on the card? Uh, I, th I think Jim Ross recently said nobody deserves a shot or a match at WrestleMania. Just sometimes it's your time and sometimes it's not. And he thinks it might be overkill. What say you? There was a time when I agreed that being on WrestleMania was not a right. It was a reward for hard work during the year, getting over, contributing to the company, um, being a team player, being a good businessman, being reliable, getting over uh, during the course of the year. Uh, but then it turned into a um, eight hour extravaganza. That's what it's morphed into. And if you're going to have an eight hour show and you've got talent who have not been on a lot of shows during the year, surely to God, you have to fill that with something. So I, I'm thinking it doesn't bother me to have that battle Royal on the pre-show and to have everyone who wasn't booked get a payday because it's still a, a sizable chunk of money. I think everybody in that battle royal gets 15 grand or something. Mm. A lot of money at my house. Absolutely. Other than taking a day off, that's for sure. Um, so, you know, I'm a little split, you know, for the guys that are, are making large chunks of money that do have, you know, pride in their work. Uh, that do feel they've contributed, that do feel they can contribute more, that should be at an angle. And some of them are justified and some of them aren't. But a lot of those guys, other than being that battle royal, would like to just take the week off and not have all the hype and doing all the personal appearances that they have to do and and, and all that stuff. Um, 
So, you know, I'm sure as a talent, you have to make that decision on, hey, you know, which is more important to me. I don't fault the company for having the Battle Royal. When they're done right, they can be fun to watch. They can be exciting. When they're not done right, they can be really shitty and long and drawn out and boring. So it, it just kind of depends on, you know, which Battle Royal shows up that day. Next up is a match for the tag team titles uh, on March the 5th on SmackDown. Big Show and Miz were scheduled to defend their unified <laughs> WWE Tag Team Championship at the event against the team who won the triple threat match between Crime Time, Hart Dynasty, and the pairing of Miz's former partners, uh, John Morrison and R Truth. Uh, of course, Morrison and Truth go on to win. So here's our match Big, uh, Big Show and Miz against Truth and Morrison for the tag titles. Um, Meltzer says I predict six minutes. I think it went about four, nothing to it. Morrison got a hot tag and ran wild before missing the twisting moonsault. Truth tried to dive, but show caught him, sent him into the post outside. Morrison ended up in the corner and show punched him in the face behind the referee's back. Miz covers him for the pin star in three quarters. We've talked a lot about Miz here on the show. I don't know that we've spent a lot of time talking about truth and Morrison. Morrison had a long absence from the company. Now he's back. Uh, what sort of upside do you think John Morrison has in WWE these days? He'll get paid. He'll make a nice salary. Uh, he'll be a guy that can go out and give you a solid performance. He's, you know, got some seasoning since he's been gone. He's been exposed to different, uh, companies and places around the world. I'm sure. And, and John Morrison was a good performer before he left. So he'll fit into a spot that, uh, you know, he'll make a nice living here. And I would think what would be the, the last, you know, seven, eight, 10, maybe 10 years left in the business. And, uh, he will be able to fly under the radar and do very well. I think. What about, uh, truth? I don't know that enough people uh, acknowledge all of his contributions to the company. I mean, this is a guy who has been, uh, a sort of company guy for a long, long time. And before that was probably put on the map in a big way uh, in the early days of NWA TNA. Uh, what can you tell us about the man behind the R-Truth character, Mr. Ron Killings? Well, he's a charlatan. Number one makes him a good fella. Uh, truth is always the guy that gives you the smile and says, you know, what do you need today? And he goes out and tries to give it to you and he works hard. You know, I don't know how old truth is, but you know, the guy still looks like a million bucks, you know, his body looks like he's 25 and, uh, you know, he goes out he works hard he does some good stuff and, uh, you know, the people still chant for him. And, uh, when they get with you and you haven't really had a win and God knows how long on television, certainly not a push, it just means they're comfortable with the character and you can last forever like that. Baby faces. Once the audience gets comfortable with you and they like your stick and they're familiar with it, it, it just makes them feel comfortable. And he's one of those type guys that, that can, uh, just go out and give you a good 10 minute segment and, uh, whatever the finish is, it is, it really doesn't matter. It's more about the performance and, and the big smile coming through the curtain and entertaining the fans. Let's keep it moving here. Next up is a match, which is the battle of legacy. It's Randy Orton versus Cody Rhodes versus Ted DiBiase. Uh, it's a three way. Uh, they get three stars here. They get, uh, plenty of time. what did you think? I think it was about a year too early. I thought so too. I felt like this stable had a lot of legs. Of course, the nickname legacy, of course, being. Randy Orton's dad, WWE Hall of Famer, Ted DiBiase Jr., his dad, of course, Hall of Famer, Cody Rhodes, of course, the son of the American dream. It feels like this could have been a, a, a really, um, I don't know, sustainable stable. They get nine minutes here on the third match on the show. I don't know. feels like it had more legs to it than me uh, and all great performers. These days, we know what Cody Rhodes is doing. You more than anybody. We know what Randy Orton's doing. And Ted Jr.'s decided to leave the business. Were you shocked when Ted left the business? 
Not really, because I go back. That that legacy thing should have been pushed and pushed, and it should have got the same throttle put to it as Evolution did. Those guys look great together, and they were young, and they were that dynamic that that you know the company was looking for. Young guys that look good, that that are dependable, that that can perform. You know, getting the rub off of Randy helped both of those guys, and they were doing great. It just, it seems like things that just flame up that weren't specifically stated, I want that to get over. When they get over by themselves, they're only allowed to get so hot because they don't want anybody to have any power or any uh, stroke or get to a point to where they're too strong and, and they might say, oh, well, how about we do this? Or listen, how about we do that? You know, it's one of it's another one of those cases because it got snuffed out for no apparent reason, and that's the only excuse it could be. It's the only reason it could have happened. One person could snuff them out, and he did. It had not ran its course. Let me put it to you that way because I worked with those guys all the time. It was still on the uptake. The crowd is absolutely bonkers uh, live for anything Randy Orton does. This is about as over. It looks like he's ever been, um, he winds up hitting Cody with the punt and then he, uh, puts him out of action uh, indefinitely in storyline as a result. And then he cuts off Ted when he's trying the million dollar slam and hits him with the RKO for the pin monster pop for that three stars. Um, but the right guy, I mean, obviously the crowd is so, so behind Randy Orton, but in an effort to, I mean, Randy Orton's been world champion. He's an established guy. You've got two younger guys. Was this the right call? I mean, based on the crowd reaction, it sounds like it. Probably, you know, if you're going to be there, which like was, we've stated it shouldn't be there. The match shouldn't even be occurring, but if it's going to occur, the right guy went over. Next up, we get Vicky doing a promo for her women's team backstage. She's hated, of course, but, uh, what a great heel she played. They do a little bit of a slim Jim tie in with cameos from Mae young and Gene Okerlund and Melina. Uh, and next up it's the money in the bank ladder match. And this was a staple of WrestleMania matches for a long time. They throw everybody in this one, Jack Swagger, Kofi Kingston, Shelton, Benjamin, MVP, Matt Hardy. Drew McIntyre, Evan Bourne, Dolph Ziggler, Kane, and Christian all in this money in the bank ladder match. Hypothetically, Arn, uh, what are the odds you would have wanted to compete in a money in the bank ladder match at WrestleMania? As you giggle through the last couple of words of that statement. (laughs) (laughs) Because I know there's zero fucking interest on your side. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. There's not even you arguing that is you You couldn't hardly get the statement out without busting a gut over it. (laughs) Yeah. I have stated for years before that I'm not climbing nothing. Right. And if you make me, once I get up there, I am going to be a man that is clinging to whatever feels stable. I'm not going to give you any kind of performance. So that would have been the same thing. I mean, I am not sure-footed. I am not one of those cats like Shelton Benjamin that can cling upside down to our top rope and hang there like a bat. I'm not one of those guys. And to to climb one of those ladders or have one of those ladders turned over on me is going to be ugly at the very, very best. Jack Swagger gets the win here. Uh, it's not that easy, though. The, I can't imagine working a match like this or putting a match together. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the finish is Swagger swings the briefcase into Christian's face. Then he tries to unhook it, but he can't get it. And, uh, it feels like Tom is just standing still. Uh, you gotta feel bad for a guy when all eyes are on him and he just can't get it done. Ultimately swagger does get it three and a half stars is the rating it gets, but with all these talents in here, this many guys, and you've got props and shit, you gotta climb and pull down and unhook putting a match like this together, whether you're in the ring or an agent feels like a nightmare. 
check. Uh, I never had the ladder matches because that's not my forte. Falling off of shit and climbing up <laughs> stuff. and That's not my experience level. That's not what I can offer this business. You want a wrestling match with some with some drama that, that uh, a guy might have won on either side of the ball two or three times before you get to the eventual winner? I can, I can come up on those for you. But falling out of the ceiling and uh, done on top of uh, some possibly broken metal that's laying underneath you at the time, you never know how a ladder's going to break, uh, is not my forte. So uh, I always watch the ladder matches with one eye open and hope and pray that all the boys or ladies come out of it unscathed. Uh, I don't think they've ever came out of one actually unscathed, but as long as they're not injured, then we'll take that. We've learned to just accept that, but they are dangerous, very dangerous. And there's that, how's that ladder going to break and uh, how's it going to fall? And if I slip or if I'm a foot and a half too far this way, what's going to be the result? A lot of danger in that match. A lot of danger in the match. And especially, you know, when you're a bigger guy, like like Drew McIntyre or Jack Swagger or Kane, uh, it's gotta be an mm. unenviable position to be in. Evan Bourne is a name that we don't hear a lot about. Uh, why don't you think Evan had a longer run in the company? Oh, I don't know. Um, Evan was, was an exciting performer. Uh, you know, I remember I had some, some matches with him and Chavo Guerrero on first match of the night. And they did a really, really good job of opening the show, giving you some good action. Um, I know that he suffered a lot of injuries and I know he wrestled for the company in a time where too small, right. it's too little, right. it's too short, which is always going to hold them back. And you go back and look at tremendous talents who worked for WWE back in that era if they didn't get used, that was probably the biggest reason why. Let's keep it moving here. Let's talk about the next match. Uh, I guess we should mention, um, swagger is going to make use of that money in the bank. But first let's talk about triple H and Sheamus. Uh, I don't think a lot of people remember this match because they usually think about triple H being much later in the card, uh, near main event, especially in this era. Here, he's not even working the longest match on the card, which has certainly been the case for as long as I can remember him and Seamus go 12 minutes and nine seconds. Um, it gets two and a quarter stars. What'd you think of, of Seamus being in such a prime time spot 10 years ago with triple H, this feels like he would have been someone handpicked by triple H triple H is kind of guy. What can you tell us about this one? Who went over? Triple H went over. I think probably Sheamus was on the way up. It would be a good rub with him to wrestle Triple H, who was might not have been positioned in the main event on the card, but he was a main event player. Um, it was probably a good, solid slug fest, and just meant to probably elevate Sheamus a little bit and get Hunter a win. No big mystery here. Um, the criticism, I think this is from Brian Alvarez is, um, he hit the spine buster for another near fall. Seamus hit a second boot. Also not a finish. Then Hunter hit him with a pedigree for a clean pin right in the middle of the ring. Way to go Seamus. So Hunter sent him home on the go home show and then beat him at the pay-per-view. And then on raw Seamus attacked him to restart the, uh, the baby face feud or restart the feud that the baby face had already won clean. Triple H may as well get a job booking TNA. In hindsight, should we have had Seamus go over? I don't know. I'm not much of a hindsight guy. Um, and I don't remember the circumstances surrounding it. Um, I can't answer that intelligently you sure. know i don't think it would have moved the needle on either guy's career right if she if seamus would have went over so let's put it like put it that way 
Well, next up, we've got a barn burner. It's Ray Mysterio and CM Punk, two big fan favorites. We should mention since the beginning of 2010, CM Punk, Luke Gallows, and Serena had been doing the straight edge lifestyle gimmick. Uh, well, it's not a gimmick for him, but they're promoting uh, that they abstain from alcohol, tobacco, and recreational drug use, and he's converting people to the straight edge society. Uh, and now it's, it's time for the match. Uh, Mysterio and Punk. They have a very good match in my opinion, but they don't get a ton of time. Only six and a half minutes. It's reviewed fairly well though. Three and a quarter stars. Uh, but when it's time for somebody to get their hand raised, it's Ray Mysterio, not CM Punk. what do you think of the match? And what can you tell us about these two talents here? Well, I think, uh, anytime you put Ray Mysterio over, it's not a mistake unless you're going to have him tap Brock Lesnar out with a submission of some sort. It's, uh, people love Ray and Ray's iconic, you know, and Ray's one of those guys on a big show that you want to have the audience leaving that night going, I really enjoyed the Ray Mysterio match. That's the kind of performer he is on your crew. And, uh, he is, you know, before you start that mess about how big a guy is and how tall a guy is, and uh, he's not jacked up enough or all that. Ray Mysterio is one of your counterpoints. You know, nobody questions how tall Ray is. No one says how much does he weigh. They just don't care. The fact is he can do things in a way and propel his body in a way that makes you believe he's actually chipping away at this much, much bigger guy and knocks him on his can. Uh, so, you know, it's all about the performance and uh, I would imagine if they would have had another five minutes, they would have been appreciative and could have told an even better story. I don't remember the match exactly, but if Ray was in it, it's hard to say it wasn't very good. Well, next up is something that fans have been looking forward to for a long time. Well, in theory, something we thought we'd never see for sure. Bret Hart finally getting revenge on Vince McMahon. They're going to actually have a wrestling match, which I can't believe is real. Before we talk about all that, I want to know from your side of things way back in the day, 1997, November, uh, just a month or two after you had, uh, what would wind up being your last wrestling match against, um, no, I guess it was 11 months later. Yeah. So this is after you've retired, you've just given your spot to Kurt Henning and, and you're now working in a backstage capacity for WCW. It's the old telephone, telegram, tele wrestler. When did you hear about the Montreal screw job? And what'd you think? Um, I'm pretty jaded. I think everything's a work. Okay. Be honest. Be honest with you. I do. I think everything's a work where it's involved in this business. You know, did they go to links to make you believe that it was, uh, legitimate, you know, yeah, you know, punching Vince McMahon, if that actually happened, I don't think, but a couple of people were in the room when it occurred. Maybe the two people involved, you know, the story that I've heard. Um, it just it, it just seems like it's one of those controversial things that you got different people taking credit for it being work. You know, you hear about, you know, I heard Brad himself tell the story about punching Vince. I don't know if you could punch Vince McMahon and get away with it without the law getting involved. You know what I mean? It's, right. uh, there's a lot to consider it. Um, I don't know. It, you know, I don't have the answer, you know, was it a legit deal. Who knows? Uh, again, I'm the guy that didn't know you could say no to anything when your boss said, this is what I want. This is what you do. So I don't fall in that category of guys that said, no, I'm not going to do it. And he went, oh, okay, well, we'll do something else. So I'm probably the wrong one to actually ask about it. When you were coming up, did you ever hear stories about promoters getting cute and trying to screw over the boys with a double cross finish? No, they were just in, in my day, they would just say, Hey, we're going to beat you. And they would beat you on TV on the way out of their, you know, if you were leaving their company or their territory, they were going to get some mileage out of you. And they would just tell you point blank, you know, if you want to get paid on the way out, this is what we want. And guys did what they wanted because they wanted to get paid out because in those days, 
people forget they held out two weeks of your pay. Right. So you would be gone and you still had two checks coming. You could get screwed pretty royally uh, by a promoter, you know, back in the day on your way out of a company. So let's pretend for a minute, you know, if, if what we've heard about the, uh, the screw job is true, that Vince goes to Brett and asks him, you know, to lose and, and Brett's not willing to, how would that have been handled back in the day? Well, if that word would have got to his opponent, there would have been some heat there, I would think. Sure. And that could, that the broad range of what could have happened is you could have just had an ugly ass piss fight, you know, pissing and, and uh, moaning, and then the bell rings, and now you got just a ugly, non drawing, non fun to watch fist fight going on in the ring, which would have only lasted. 45 seconds and then what you know that's the worst case scenario you could have had um not being in one of those situations it, I've, you know I, i've never seen one of the guys revolt against a promoter and win that one um later when you had guaranteed contracts and all that stuff things i guess changed but i go back to the era when you worked for a promoter and he paid your salary and, and that was the end of the story. So, you know, it's, uh, who knows? Let's, uh, let's talk about the match here. Uh, Brett's going to come out in uh, his jacket and jean shorts. Vince comes out on the, on the ramp, cuts a promo saying this is WrestleMania and therefore Brett deserves a WrestleMania size screwing. He says he spared no expense on a bunch of lumberjacks. He said that Brett screwed Brett, Vince screwed Brett, and tonight Brett's family is going to screw Brett. So out come all the hearts, Bruce, Diana, the Hart Dynasty, Natalia, etc. And Bruce is working as a referee. And Brett cuts a promo saying he's learned something about double crosses and he talked to his family beforehand. They told him what was up. And tonight the Hart family is all united behind him. And Vince was screwed again. So they start the match and Brett just destroys him to the point where when he's doing it with chair shots, people start to feel sorry for Vince McMahon, which is probably saying something ultimately puts him in the sharpshooter. Uh, he's killed forever. And, uh, this is the last match for Bret Hart and it's probably not the prettiest match. It gets negative three stars. One of the greatest wrestlers of all time. Um, but. I guess it was entertaining if you were a Brett fan and felt like Vince screwed him. I don't know, man. It's just weird that it's here. You were there when it happened. Uh, what'd you think? I think it's like the dog that lives next door that barks all night and just has heat with you on a nightly basis. Cause you, you never get a good night's sleep. Finally, that dog jumps the fence and gets run over by a truck. You thought you'd feel good about seeing it, but it was one of those things you couldn't look and you couldn't look away. And the dog just just gets murdered by the truck and you go, God, I thought I'd enjoy watching this, but that was pretty ugly because that was not good. No, it was not. And the more people got involved in it, the worse it got technology wise or technically it was just not good. Did you hear that? I mean, there was a rumor. I don't know if this is true, but allegedly the company was trying to get Earl Hebner involved in the match, which I guess would have made sense since they're really making it all about the screw job. Of course he winds up not being here, but did you hear that? No, I didn't know about that. That's that would have been an inside thing that, that they would have done as a surprise for everybody. They wouldn't have wanted that getting out, I'm sure. And I'm sure got Earl got, you know, according to him, hearing a couple of the interviews he's made over the years, he got so much flack for that. He wouldn't have done that just for a payoff, I don't think. Because he got a lot of shit over that, I believe. Well, next up, we've got a world title match. This is for the World Heavyweight Championship. Chris Jericho is your champion. He's going to be defending against Edge. Um, it gets three and a quarter stars. Uh, all told it's probably 
second longest match on the show, 15 minutes, 48 seconds, certainly two bona fide hall of famers, two former world champions. Uh, when it's all said and done, Jericho successfully defends and gets the win over edge. Uh, they are, they don't have any sort of, um, issue with pulling out all the stops here, announce tables being speared through the dasher boards, all that stuff. Tons of booze live for edge. what do you think? Yeah, I thought those guys enjoyed working together. They busted their ass. The company gave them some tools to go out and have a main event match. And they did, which I was glad to see, you know, when you got horses that can run, got thoroughbreds, let them run. Uh, next up, we've got an interesting match. It's Alicia Fox, Layla, Maurice, Michelle McCool, and Vicky Guerrero on one side, Beth Phoenix, Eve Torres, Gail Kim, Kelly Kelly, and Mickey James. So it's 10, it's a 10 man or 10 woman match five on five all told it gets three minutes and 26 seconds and well, it sucks. Um, the girls are all going to take turns beating Vicky. Everybody hits a finisher on each other. Some of them, not the best timed spots. And then. Vicky's leaning too far back on a pin attempt and Kelly's shoulder goes up and the referee decides he has to stop the count. Vicky gets all confused, eventually gets back on top for the pin and gets the win. It gets one star in the write up, but that's probably maybe a little too polite. I think Meltzer or not Meltzer, but Bruce and, and Jr. would call this a quote unquote, let me up match where you don't want to have a really hot world title match. And then another one. You need the fans to be able to take a breather. I guess that's why it's placed here. What'd you think? Well, you, you know, in that group of girls, you got some ladies that could perform. Absolutely. You, you know, there were some very good performers in that match. And, uh, in particular, you should shout them out. Mickey James, tremendous Gail Kim, very underrated Beth Phoenix. Unbelievable. I mean, you got some really talented in ring performers here. Yeah, on both sides of the ball. Yeah. I mean, you do. You know, to not give, you can't give that 10 minutes. I mean, if you're featuring all the ladies and the ladies are on the upswing and, you know, the their performances are just getting better and better, give them 10 minutes for God's sakes. You know, it just, it's like making those decisions. Who's ever making those decisions has got to be a little smarter about that because ultimately, you know, if that's what's remembered about the match, they don't start singling out, okay, but Gail Kim was tremendous and Beth Phoenix was tremendous and, you know, all these talents, you don't start singling them out. You just go, well, the match was not good. And that's not fair to them because they could have gave you a good match if they hadn't have been jammed up in there under such a short time frame. Next up, John Cena and Batista. It feels like these are the faces mm. of the company for a long, long time. They get 13 minutes and 31 seconds. This is for the WWE title. Uh, the review shows that it gets four stars, really good stuff. Dave's going to go for the power bomb one more time, but Cena rolls out, puts the STF back on. Dave fights and fights and fights, but knows he's trapped and eventually gives up. And, uh, I don't know. I like it. I thought it was very well done. So did, uh, Brian Alvarez. 13 minutes, 31 seconds. John Cena is your world champion. I mean, John Cena in WrestleMania, this is peas and carrots. You were the agent for this match. What do you remember? Must've been a hell of an agent putting that wrestling match together. That's all <laughs> I can tell you. Cause if I remember correctly, that's what it was. It was about holds and moves and drama and who's in control and whoop, he's going to get out. Oh, nope. He doesn't get out. There's more heat and all those things that really have built the industry. And those guys I'm sure went out. I mean, it wasn't a, it wasn't a street fight and it wasn't a no DQ or any of those things. Correct. It was a wrestling match. It was a wrestling cool. match. And obviously Cena has the big entrance, you know, which has become a Cena staple, especially in this era. We've got the air force doing, uh, you know, the whole gun twirling exhibition as the music hits. Uh, and then when it's time, you know, for the bell to ring, 
and, uh, Cena's going to be victorious. One of the cool things that, that Brian notes is well, as he's in the STF quote, it was so great because he meaning Batista knew with such certainty that he'd been beaten that he just kept tapping. Even after Cena released the hold, I've never seen anyone do that before. And I need to steal it. The work was, uh, clunky at points, but live, this was such an awesome match. I think as, as much criticism as John got over the years for his in-ring work of, oh, he's just got the five moves of doom and whatever else the naysayers may say, he earned a reputation as being quote unquote, big match. John, when the pressure was on for him to deliver a big match at a big show, you could pretty much count on John Cena to deliver every time. Could you not? Yeah, because the one thing that gets skipped over and no one wants to give him credit for is his selling. John would sell too much for guys. And he would get cut off early during a match with a guy that shouldn't have cut him off that early. You know, so, you know, he might have had the five moves of doom or whatever the, the, the knock was on him. But the fact is, the thing that got John over was he looked incredible, and he sold. And for all you young youngsters out there that are asking what the, you know, how do you get over? If you were going to give me some advice, what would it be? Sell. Without selling, we have nothing in this industry. If if you watch a boxing match. And the two guys go out there for 15 rounds and just punch each other in the face and nobody's head ever snaps back. Nobody ever gets in trouble. Nobody ever gets hurt. That's going to get mighty boring. And you can be knocking each other's heads off. When it gets interesting is when a guy gets hurt and a guy gets in trouble. Selling is what made John Cena. And it made Shawn Michaels, and it made Ricky Morton, and it made Ricky Steamboat, and Barry Windham, and Dusty Rhodes, and now Cody Rhodes. Selling is your way to getting over. Let's talk about what really got over. The main event here, it's a rematch from WrestleMania 25. Most people consider WrestleMania 25's uh, Shawn Michaels Undertaker match to be not only the match of the year, but perhaps one of the best matches in WrestleMania history, if not the best match in WrestleMania history, that's all a matter of taste, but there's no decision here. Uh, other than we've got to do this again, we've got to do a rematch, but this time let's raise the stakes instead of Shawn Michaels trying to just end the streak. He's got to put something on his side and that's his career. So it's career versus streak. These guys get plenty of time. It's the longest match on the show. 23 minutes, 59 seconds. You know what's coming. The Undertaker wins. Four and three quarter stars. About as good as it's going to get. Jumping power tombstone for the pin. Two of the all-time greats. Afterwards, they shake hands. And uh, then Taker leaves. Sean waves goodbye to everyone. Uh, He's crying. And it's written that he looks almost more relieved that this was all over than sad. Everyone gives him a standing ovation and thank you, Sean. And he walks away and, uh, everyone stands up to leave. This is uh, a special moment because just two years prior to this in 2008, he retired Ric Flair and now the undertaker retires him, uh, sort of the end of an era. What'd you think of this one? Great story, huh? Without question. Just like you recapped it two years earlier, he retired Flair. They have the greatest match, you know, recognized by some as the greatest match of all time. And then come right behind it with Sean being retired. That's a hell of a three, three year story. I would think. Absolutely. Um, Sean knew when it was time, you know, I'm sure him and Taker both left it all in the ring that night. Uh, on both sides and um, as it is Sean has not came back from retirement to this day no he has he popped up at uh, uh, he, he wrestled for the Saudis last year 
That was the first time, right? I Actually time. Being, being in a match. Yep. He shaved his head bald and people were freaked out. Hey, he's back and he's bald and he's in Saudi Arabia. It was a lot to unpack. <laughs> the only thing could add to that story would have been if they left him over there and he was still there and he was like a prince or a king or <laughs> some, some shit like that or a camel herder or something. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> Knowing Sean could have been anything, whatever, whatever floated his boat at the time. Um, so, you know, when you have a match like that, it, it just, it just is mentally exhausting as a fan. And you really feel like not only did you get your money's worth, you saw something that will, uh, you know, endure the test of time and it has, and um, I was glad to have been there and seen it. I was one of the people waiting to shake their hand and thank them both for what they did for the show and the, the company and the business in general. And just me as a fan, getting to watch it as a fan, I was just, you know, thank you for that, you know, giving me that memory as, as a wrestling fan. So two of the greatest of all time, two of the greatest that will endure the test of time. And anyone that was there to see it live can put themselves in that category of, Hey, I was there for the greatest match ever. And the fact that it, the one the year before was recognized is that, well, maybe it was technically, but I think story wise, the one that retired Shawn Michaels is about as stout as it gets. The next day he has the big, uh, retirement speech. The crowd's chanting one more match. Undertaker comes out, tips his cap. Um, he's pouring his heart out here saying you've allowed me to come into your home every week since I was uh, 23. Now I'm 44, 44, man, still really, really early. Uh, to step away, but I guess behind the scenes, Sean had started talking about retirement two years prior, uh, even the year that, that flair left, he's taken some sabbaticals for, uh, you know, a lot of time here and there along the way. Um, uh, but he even says in his speech, he hopes he never wrestles again. You know, he wanted this to be it. And I think one of the things I've heard from Sean over the years is you know, as a, as a wrestler, he was always in search of the perfect match and the perfect match never existed, but he really held himself to a high standard. And he said after WrestleMania 25, I think he told his wife on the way back to the house, cause they could drive to the show instead of flying. I think that's it. I don't think I'll ever have a match better than that. And I think he probably made the decision that he wanted to retire right then. Did you ever have thoughts like that when you were an in-ring performer that man i don't know that i'll have a match better than that and not want to ruin it by continuing or did you, was your wiring different than that no i wasn't i wasn't capable of having the kind of match that sean michaels could have to be honest with you and certainly not capable of being in a match with you know him or undertaker that could reach the levels that those guys reached. Um, I just was not as quality a performer as either one of those guys, to be honest with you. So there was never a time that, that I came back through the curtain and went, that's the, you know, that's the greatest match I'll ever have. I should just call it quits here. Um, you know, it's, it's when you're, I think Sean probably felt that, if the truth's known, not only was that first match with Undertaker so good, I think you feel your body and you feel what you're capable of. Let's just say if, you, if I had a 10-minute match facing me the next night on Raw after, after putting myself out there like those guys did at Mania, you would go, Holy God, can I get through that 10 minute match tomorrow? You know, I, I left it all out there. And when you've had injuries and nagging injuries and things that kept you out of wrestling for a period of time, you know, you realize you're never the same as you were when you were whole. Once you start having 
and I'm not talking about getting hurt in the ring. I'm talking about injuries, things that keep you out three to six months. Once you have a couple of those under your tool belt and you realize what your limitations are and you went out and adrenaline pushed you and fan reaction pushed you and maybe you just felt good that day and an undertaker felt good that day and maybe the two of you actually even overperformed for where your injury level might have been if that makes any sense at that point in your career and you really overachieved and you nailed it and the timing was perfect story was perfect fan reaction was perfect uh you do realize that man that's as good as it's ever going to get um a lot of things probably went into that thought process for Sean. Uh, I never had those defining moments. I knew when it was over that I'd had my last match, how that felt. Um, and I know just like getting through Luger when that, that last um, injury happened and that left hand shut down for me and I still had to wrestle Lex Luger at Halloween Havoc you know how was I going to get through that match and I didn't know the severity of the injury but I knew I couldn't grip anything with my hand and things are going through your mind and going through your head and it's like man I can't go go out here and just do whatever I want because I can't grab with my left hand and uh, I went through that type mental torture, but nothing like Sean and Sean did. It's unbelievable that he walked out, you know, when he was 44, especially when you consider, you know, some of the guys that we see wrestling every day now, you know, I, it's almost a joke on my podcast. Now I remind people, you know, that AJ styles is 42 or, you know, that Chris Jericho is uh 49 and, and Sean's here walking away at, at 44. Um, WrestleMania overall, when it came to the uh, reader poll of the wrestling observer, it got 77.6% thumbs up, 6.8% thumbs down, 15.6% thumbs in the middle. I'm going thumbs up if nothing else, just because of undertaker, Sean Michaels, what say you? Yeah, for sure. And I'll throw another one at you that, you know, because it's a joke now that I was born 40 years old, I was 37. Yeah when I had to retire today, that then that's just, you're just hitting your stride at 37, you know? So, you know, I felt like I had a full career and this is not about me. I'm not making it about me, but just to show you, you know, it felt like 15 years was a good full wrestling career, but still having to retire at 37 feels young to me. And, uh, Sean being 44, you know, he, he still had probably a couple of years in the tank, just judging by today's standards. Sure. When did you have a conversation with Sean about you know, his retirement in this era? Uh, I'm sure we have. I'm sure we've talked about it uh, a couple times, you know, and just in general. And you know, all of our all of our thought processes, the veterans that that, you know, had a good level head and had a plan for their life and a plan for after wrestling. And we're, you know, you're taking care of your family, you're taking care of your future and doing all the right things to, to prepare for that day. Um, you kind of had, you know, an age maybe set out there. Hey, I'd like to be done by this age so I could still, watch high school football, hypothetically, you had done the math to where your kids are going to be in high school playing ball and sports. And you want to see that, you know, and you want to be there for all that. But very few people actually get to plan their careers and plan their exit strategies and have it actually work out the way they had originally thought. Uh, and we had, you know, conversations mostly about how you feel and, you know, you glad you made the decision and all that stuff. And, you know, pretty much Sean was, I think he made the right decision at the right time. Without question. And we hope you guys made the right decision and you hit the subscribe button, leave us a five-star review and tell your friends about your favorite new podcast, Arn, only on Westwood one every Tuesday. Next week, we're back with another hashtag ask Arn anything. If you haven't already go ask your question to Arn. You can hear your question next week here on the show. It's at the Arn Show on Twitter. 
That's right. Follow us on Twitter. It's free. Come on, participate. What's wrong with you at the Arn show. And then on the 24th, we'll be back with another WrestleMania. This one is WrestleMania 31. You want to talk about recent? That's pretty doggone recent, man. This one went down 2015. It's most famous, I guess, for Sting Triple H. We'll get into that and everything else in two weeks. But next week, we're back with another Q&A. Stay tuned right here every single Tuesday on Westwood One. It's Arn with Arn Anderson. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.